Carpenters Ministry presents this refreshing and life-changing teaching. We trust that this message will be a blessing to you. Living Life Under Open Heavens, Part 6. Again, Living Life Under Open Heavens, Part 6. Why do we do that? We celebrate the word of God in this church. Amen. What are open heavens? Open heavens are characteristic of living the supernatural life. That's the life that Jesus introduced us to. That's the life of God. Our text has been from Ezekiel 1, 1 to 3. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Cheba, that the heavens were opened and three supernatural experiences happened. One, I saw visions of God on the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. Two, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Cheba, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Three, so visions of God the word of the Lord, and the hand of the Lord. Three supernatural experiences. What we've been studying in the last five, and this is the sixth one, um, parts is visions of God. And that is still where we are. We've been answering some questions. How do you see these visions? With what do you see these visions? When do you see these visions? What do you see? We we started looking at that last um, part. So what do you see? We said the things you see are visions of God. They are visions that are bigger than you. They are visions that require patience from you. They are visions that are unique to each individual. They are visions that do not change with circumstances. Amen. So we're still answering that question, what do you see? And the sixth and final answer is they are revelations. Remember, we change we can interchange the word visions for revelations remember that so they are revelations that bring direction clarification inspiration and liberation they are they are visions or they are revelations that bring direction clarification inspiration and liberation So every vision or revelation that God gives to you is ultimately to give you these four things. Of course, somebody else can preach and add more. I can decide to add more as well, but let's just stay with these four. You receive direction, you receive clarification, you receive inspiration, and you receive liberation. Say after me, direction, clarification, inspiration, and liberation. So let's define those words. We're talking about what visions and revelations of God, that God is bringing out in these open heavens, what they do for you. Direction. A course, C-O-U-R-S-E, a course along which someone or something moves. A course along which someone or something moves. The course which must be taken in order to reach a destination, the course which must be taken in order to reach a destination. From where I live, if I want to get to Wari, when I come out of the gate, I turn right. If I want to get to Enugu, when I come out of the gate, I turn left. How about if I want to get to Enugu and I turn right? Will I ever get to my destination? Probably in a long, convoluted way but not directly, as worry would have just gotten me, you know, I would have gotten to worry just by turning right and following the road. Same way, by turning left and following the road, I would have gotten to Enugu. So if we're saying that these revelations give you direction, and direction is the course you need to follow to get to your destination, it means these revelations can cause you to do a complete turnaround in your life. Amen. It means you can receive these visions and revelations from God under these open heavens, and you end up heading in an opposite direction from where you were heading. So it means in this time of open heavens, you need to be flexible. 
you need to be ready to change. Because God is here to give you direction. But if you insist, no, I want to go right and I want to get to Enugu, you'll never get there. Therefore, you'll never partake of the open heavens that are waiting for you at that destination. Amen. Next thing is clarification. Clarification is the action of making a statement or situation less confused and more comprehensible. It is the action of making a statement or situation less confused and more comprehensible or more understandable. Have you ever come to church and you had some questions? Even some questions you were, unfortunately, shouldn't be that way, ashamed to ask. You don't want to ask a pastor or ask someone because if I say to you, are you still having those kind of questions? You've been a believer for so long, so you keep it in you. And you come to church and it's like the preacher knows what's on your mind. And the word of the Lord begins to come forth and there is clarification. You're no longer confused about that matter. You can see it, you can understand it ever so clearly. Has that happened to anybody? Oh, certainly it's happened to me. So that's the kind of thing that these visions of God bring for you. God can show you things, begin to teach you things with the grace present in this season. And you'll have clarification of those areas that have troubled you. And like I said, you may not have been willing or able to ask anyone. So expect clarification this season. Expect to receive visions and revelations from God, understanding from God that will make things less confusing for you and things will be crystal clear in your understanding. Amen. Thirdly, inspiration. Inspiration is the process of being mentally stimulated. This is a dictionary definition, but I'll stay with mentally because your mind is what gets renewed. So let's keep it that way. The process of being mentally stimulated to do or feel something. Especially to do something creative. The quality of being inspired. Has any message from God ever inspired you to take a step of faith? Or inspired you to begin to do things you never thought you could do? That is what visions and revelations of God bring to you. Because all around you... There are things to demotivate you. You put on the television, you can get demotivated. You listen to some of your friends, believers, you get discouraged and demotivated. But visions and revelations from God are there to inspire you, to push you, to want to do something you never thought you could do until you got that revelation. To push you, a normal person would not have dreamt of building this kind of auditorium. But I believe that the inspiration that came upon Pastor Charles when he began to see this kind of building could only have come from God, could only have come from an open heaven. Because if you look at yourself, look at your background, look at the size of the church at that time, you, even at this time, you can't contemplate building that kind of building. But visions and revelations from an open heaven will inspire you to take steps of faith that look impossible. And that's what we should expect this season. Amen. Don't just let this year pass you by. Expect to step into things, step into dreams that you cannot do without inspiration, not from a man, but from an open heaven. Amen. And lastly, liberation. Liberation. And this is probably the one I like the most. Liberation is the action of setting someone free from imprisonment, slavery, or oppression. Liberation is the action of setting someone free from imprisonment slavery or oppression liberation is to release to release and this definition this next one sums it up for me liberation is freedom from limits on thought or behavior liberation is freedom from limits on thoughts or behavior have you ever found yourself limiting the things God can do or the things God can do through you in your mind? So when you hear liberation, don't just think about liberation from a bad habit like smoking or a bad habit like being too sexually involved with people or a bad habit of gossiping and you say, oh, I have been set free. All of that is great. But for most of us believers, where we actually need to get liberation is in our mind. 
you need to be set free to think big. You need to be set free to remove the limits. You need to be set free to see the impossible become impossible. You need to be set free to make your life count. Don't just be a Christian who floats through life. And one day you wake up, you are 75, 80 years old, you are planning to die. And you have left no impact. There is nothing anybody can hold and say, this is what you did. This is what you are known for. You can even be known for kindness. You can be known for giving. But sometimes these things bind you. You just are known for nothing. Nothing. There's no way you can say you have put your life and this is really what you are known for. Do you understand what I'm saying? And it can be in the smallest things. Even in the service you do in the house of God. I was replying your son. He sent me a mail, the one that talks to me. And I was telling him, I was talking about school. And, you know, good things happening to him in school, you know, and all that. And I said to him, you know, apart from he was saying his parents, how his parents are awesome and he believes God and me in his parents' life, he said. You know, I've made his parents so awesome and all of that. But then I said to him, and I've said that same thing to Chibokem before. I said to him, I said, do you know that you are the harvest of all the children your mom in her ministry has invested in in the children's church. That's something to be known for. And I said that to him in the mail I sent to him. I said, you know, everything is happening to you, but your mom has been in the children's church for like 20 something years. And she's been there missing services, missing programs for other people's children. People who don't even know her, who don't thank her. Do you think you will invest like that in people's children and your own children will miss? Except your children want to miss. Every favor already surrounds them because what you sow is what you reap. So you can be known for something. Okay, it's known in the children's church. Ike is known. They've given decades of their lives for the poor children. And I can begin to call other departments and say those kind of things. But don't just be someone who floats through life. And at the end of the day, you amount to nothing. No, make your life count. Amen. Make your life count. Set yourself free. From I can't really do, I can't be known for anything. Yes, you can. You can even be known for the one who's been cleaning the church for 20 years. And that's what you could be known for. Again, I say make your life count. Glory be to God. So let's get on to some of the categories of the revelations that God is pouring out. We're saying these revelations bring you direction, clarification, inspiration, liberation, and probably so much more. So the first one we're looking at today is revelation of who God is. Revelations of who God is. This sounds so basic, but I can tell you it's very relevant to a lot of us. Revelations of who God is. It's amazing how many people know of God, know of people who know God, and they've heard of God through those people, but they don't know God. I'll say it again. It is amazing how many people know of God, have heard of God from people who know God, but they don't know God for themselves. Now, that's okay if they are unbelievers. But I'm talking about people in the body of Christ. Christians, you and I, born again people. Born again Christians. Who will go to heaven if they die? Born again, tongue talking. I'm not talking about Christians. Born again. They know of God. They've heard of God from people who say they know God. But they don't know God for themselves. As a pastor, I can tell you that this applies to a good number of people in this congregation where God is preached in undiluted forms. You know of God. You've heard about him. You've heard of him. You've heard of the God that Pastor Nkechi teaches. You've heard of the God that Pastor Shola teaches. This is God. You know of him. You can call his names. You can say this is what they say about him. But do you know him for yourself? Is the question. Can somebody learn of God from you? Do you know God for yourself? Do you have a revelation of who God is? 
that is probably tested the most in times of adversity and situations. And I'll get to that later. Do you know who God is? Do you know who God is? The Bible says in Psalm 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. Look at your neighbor and tell them, be still. What are you being still about? All those things around you threatening the identity of God. Just be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. God wants you to know him. God doesn't just want you to know of him or hear about him from those who say they know him. God wants you to know him for yourself. God has been a victim of identity theft. Anybody knows what identity theft is? When somebody takes your identity and pretends to be you. If you think identity theft is a problem among human beings, God has been a victim of identity theft. You might go to a country, particularly one of these Western, all well, these developed countries, and do a poll and ask, and they did, they did one recently in the US, and ask how many people know God. And they got a high number that got Christians excited. Then they began to fine tune. How many people know the God of the Bible? The number drastically, almost halved. Why? Those who said they knew God were referring to Buddha, Allah, some new age thing, and worst of all, self-consciousness. Have you heard that self-rubbish going around? Which is a serious sign of the last days. You worship yourself, you idolize, idolize yourself. Philodonos, Philotos, Philodonos, all those things we discussed, remember? You, you, you worship yourself. In fact, a man of God put it this way. Self-kissing. You, oh, I'm just the best thing that happened. What I feel becomes the truth. And that's what's going on now, in case you don't know. The feeling of somebody becomes their mark of absolute truth. That's identity theft. That person has found their God. So you ask the question, how many of you know God? You get like 80% of the country. You begin to break it down. How many of you know the God of the Bible? I will break it down even further and ask how many of you know the God of the Bible for yourself? The number will shrink even more. So yeah, you know the God of the Bible. You know of him. You've heard of him. God wants you to know him for yourself. Church, I said God wants you to know him for yourself. He wants a relationship with you. Not with you through your church or with you through your pastor. I said this in the first service by inspiration. I want to say it again. A lot of churches, and you know them. I'm going to call them, you know them. There's no need to. Whose members refer to God as the God of their bishop. Have you heard that before? Some of your friends do it with pride. And you begin to feel that your pastor does not have a God. As they call the God of their bishop and the God of this person, you too, you want to call the God of Nkechiene. Don't try it. Don't try it. Don't try it. You will make me very sad. The day I hear you refer to God as the God of Nkechiene, you have marked me as a pastor and you have marked me F. When I want to be marked an A is when each of you can say the God of Shola, the God of Uloma, the God of Osi, like that. He's your God. Know him for yourself. I may inspire you, but that's about where it ends. Please don't call him the God of Nkechiene. I don't need it. Call him the God of you. You see, I was pastor in the Old Testament. They used to say, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then transport yourself back in time to the Old Testament before Jesus. Look in the New Testament. Did you see it there? Does Paul say the God of Paul? God says, my father and your father. It's going to be the God of yourself. I said the God of who you are. And if you come with God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then I was saying, you need to transport yourself back. After Jesus, there was no need for that. You have direct access to the Father. 
and give me an A marking by knowing God for yourself. I said that the other day I was preaching. I don't want any umbilical cords attached to me. Get born again and grow in the word. And you bring other people to the kingdom. Fill up these seats. Get more sheep coming in. It's sheep that beget sheep. It's only a pastor, a bishop who is insecure. That loves it when the people call God after him. Don't you want to show the people the way to God themselves? That's what you should be doing. So hit your chest and say, my father is the God of, and call your name. My father is the God of, and call your own name. He is my father. I have access to him. He is the God of, call your own name. Amen. You've got to know God for yourself. Be still. God's desire is for you to know him. Amen. So let's begin to look at areas in which we need to know God. Now just say a few things and give you scriptures and that's really that. So people still struggle with the truth that God is good and he gives only good. That's one area of knowing God that unfortunately, and when I say people, I'm talking about believers. Believers still struggle with the truth that God is good. And he only gives good. Especially in the times of adversity. When things unexpectedly evil happen. Maybe you lose a loved one. Or you've worked so hard. And you get fired in your job. A temptation can come to say, ah, God. What happened? But when you take it further and begin to open your mouth and say, no, don't tell me that God is good stuff again. If God was good, he wouldn't have allowed this to happen. Then you didn't have a revelation. I don't judge you. I just declare it to you. So you can seek to have a revelation. Church, God is good. I said God is good. There's a brother who loved, who lost a loved one. And every time I saw him or spoke to him, he would declare God is good. I believe he was doing that to affirm it to himself. Because in that season, he was obviously threatened. So he wouldn't even let you say it before he says it. I know God is good. That's a revelation. That's somebody who knows that God is good. Listen, church. God, God does not choose to be good. The only thing God can be is good. God doesn't say, I'm going to be good. I want to be good to you. No, God cannot be bad to you. He cannot. He has to change his identity as God to be bad to you. God is good all the time in every situation. God is good. God's DNA is good. He cannot produce bad. The example I gave in the first service, Kitoya is here now. I said it, Pastor Lan, uh, Kitoya, give birth to a half caste child. Okay, like I will have a meeting with her. Kitoya. I will say Kitoya. She'll say, Yes, mommy, Pastor. I said, come with that, your mommy, Pastor, please. Come and see that. Tell me what happened. This boy is a half caste. You say, no, my grandfather was yellow. Mbana. This is not yellow. This is half. Oyibo is coming out of everywhere. My daughter's twins, one of them, Melsha. Melsha looks like, should I call it quarter caste? Melsha's hair is very soft. Oyibo. So we have now decided that uh, Tracy's great grand, some bother, was met by one of these Oibos that used to come to Port Harcourt uh, Riverside. Because that's her color. What is helping Trace is that she had twins at the same time. One is uh, normal. <laughs> the other one is looking like a half-caste. So we're not questioning her too much. But if you have one baby and it comes as half-caste, that thing came from somewhere. And it's not generational. It's now, now, now. The only thing 
that uh, Shalom and Kitoy can produce is uh, black. It's black. And Shalom was trying to claim that his mother was yellow. I knew his mother. Oh, yellow is not like that. That will enter half caste. What's my point? Yeah, I'm not listening to you. What's my point? Black and black cannot ever produce half caste without GBT while you're being there. And there's no GBT here in Jesus' name. <laughs> so they cannot produce half caste. God cannot produce bad. He cannot. He said, but God was so angry. He now punished me. You have the wrong God. Before Christ, maybe. After Christ, never. When you do bad, what you get from God is good. See, pastor, don't be saying these things. So people will not serve God. People who don't want to serve God will not serve him. I want to say it again. God is so good that when you do bad, what he rewards you with is good. Say, pastor, prove it. Is mercy good? When you do bad, what do you get from God? He's rich in mercy. Plusius in mercy. Again, I repeat, to some religious demons we live here. When you do bad, what God offers you is good. It's not your choice to believe it and take it or say, no, I must punish myself. So watch you do it. God cannot be bad. Church, regardless of the opposition or the adversity I may ever see, even with tears in my eyes, I will lift my hands and declare God is good. And that declaration will bring about restoration faster than I can work it for myself. That declaration will invoke the goodness of God like rain pouring from an open heaven. That declaration will kickstart such a restoration that I'll be catching up, but the thing is overwhelming me. That is what you do if you have a revelation. What took us through? Pastor Charles is going home. We just kept declaring God is good. Pastor Taya had written a song. You guys may not know she's the one that wrote it. Faithful, I judge you faithful. That song came just at the time. And that song ministered. God gave her the song just before this thing happened. Am I right? And the praise and worship team rocked that song. You are God, you are not man. You are faithful, you are true. So in the midst of the pain, you sing that song over and over and over again. And it becomes revelation. That God is good and God is faithful. Regardless of what you see. He's faithful. He's good. He's reliable. He's dependable. There is a Satan who takes advantage of situations. Satan's activities cannot redefine God's identity. He can't. He can't. I'll repeat it. Satan's activities can never redefine God's identity. <laughs> you must be solid and secure in knowing that God is good. Glory be to God. Let me give you some scriptures. Psalm 86, verse 5. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Do you see good and do you see mercy? Huh? Psalm 180. Am I right in that? 118 verse 18. Verse 1, eh? Okay, why do I have 18 here? Psalm 118 verse 1. Oh, give thanks. Yes, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For what? You see mercy again? That's what God has to offer you. His mercy endures forever. Psalm 145 verse 9. The Lord is good to those who do good. 
Psalm 145 verse 9. The Lord is good to those who do good. To how many? What does all mean? Hey, if you are going to exclude anybody from the goodness of God, start with yourself. The Lord is good to all. He's good to all. Again, see mercy. And his tender mercies are over how many of his works? All his works. Are you a work of God? Are you part of his workmanship? Created unto good works. Is that you? He's good towards you. Luke 18, 18 to 19. A certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. Jesus said, Nobody is good but God. In other words, Jesus is saying, Any goodness, for it to be relevant, for it to be valid, has to be drawn from the one who is good, the only one who is good. If your goodness is not rooted in the goodness of God, it's invalid. God is good. God is good, church. Psalm 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing, no good thing, no good thing, no good thing. What are good things? What are good things? I can't hear you. Children. Good houses. Huh? Health. Health. Huh? Abundance. Wealth. The pastors are talking. They're collecting everything. Be there. Huh? Peace. Okay, these sisters, you are posing. You will not call husband. Be there. What is a good thing? A wet head. Remember, the number one thing on your mind now is husband. You will not say husband. Because I have not said, just say the Lord receive your husband. You bring your head like this. I'm asking you simply now, what is a good thing? You're not catching the revelation. What is a good thing? What is a good thing? Okay, your brothers don't want to talk. What is a good thing? The Bible says no good thing. No good thing. You define what you call a good thing. No good thing will he withhold because he is good. James 1, 7, every good and 17, every good and perfect gift comes from where? Above. It all comes from him. Why would he withhold it? What does he need it for? Does God need husband? Does he need wife? Does he need abundance? Does he need health? So if he has every good thing, it's for you. And he won't withhold it from you. But you've got to know he's good. And he's a source of only good. Amen. Amen. Second thing people still struggle with, the truth that God is love. That God is love. God is love. I didn't say God loves only. He is love. Again, just like he is good. Any true love has got to be rooted in the love of God. When I talk to my daughters and other young ladies about praying for a husband, after you have prayed for broad shoulders, anyway, your own is not broad. You have prayed for all those things, all those physical attributes. You prayed for money. Your number one prayer should be to marry a man who loves God. Because if you marry a man who loves God, you are guaranteed that you are marrying a man who loves you. It's only a man who's connected to the source of love. That can truly give love. And why some of you don't pray that kind of prayer. Is because you don't know what love is. Some people grew up and they never had love from their parents. Assuming when Zeno was 14. 
you love Zeno so much, you bought him a car. And Zeno's friends, I know you will never do that. <laughs> Theo Shuki said like that. Zeno's friends meet him and say, hey, your father bought you this car. Your dad really loves you. Does he? What are you buying a 14-year-old a car for? Some people have killed their children. Children are dead today because of such foolishness. 14. Okay, move it to 16. Foolishness. You can begin to talk at 18. Maybe. An 18 day and 18 day. If you know your 18 year old still act like a 14 year old, big no, you kill that child. That's not love. But people think that is love. Sometimes such things are done for your own pride. Oh, that's my son. He's only 16. We bought him a car. That's my son. He's in the mortuary. He drove d- drunk and crashed he and his friends. So what you want to say? But that's not love. We have such a, such a warped understanding. People do all kinds of things. And you do that kind of thing. You know what you are doing? You are putting an entitlement mentality in the children. Some of the worst kids to run across run across in the US and Nigerian kids. Some of the worst kids, you put them on a plane and dare to put them in economy. They would throw a tantrum right there in the airport. But dad, I didn't know it was economy. Dad, you know, I don't fly economy. Shut your stinking. Bring that child. Let me baptize him. Have you not seen those kind of children who freak out because they're not flying business class? Entitlement, their father's money. Sometimes just shock your children if you're used to buying them business class and buy them economy and watch them. If they react, extend the glory for more days. Your next five tickets will be in economy. Otherwise, you'll be that child who has an entitlement, mental, will never learn how to work for themselves. And some of you are struggling, eating your tight, stealing, borrowing, so you show your children that you love them. You don't love them. Amen. I'm showing you wrong perceptions of love. That's why you can't get a revelation of the unconditional love of God. What is love? What is love for a man to his wife? What is love for a woman to her husband? I believe that a man should once in a while help his wife in the kitchen, particularly if your wife He's working hard. My husband is a perfect man, but he's still grasping that revelation. He grasped it at the time of marriage. Then he forgot it. We are still trying to remind him. But I don't hurry to do it because anytime he enters kitchen, we wash plate for like three hours. Word, word, word. Okay, I'll make you dinner today. Yay, daddy is making dinner. It's egg and plantain. He will use like three different frying pan with three different oil for the plantain. The egg, he'll be videoing himself. How can we fry egg? He will put the iPad there and be doing with him. Now we are, fr- we are about to flip it. <laughs> then he will flip it onto another place. He will bring another pot. By the time you all the pots in your kitchen. I tell him, thank you for your love, but love me another way. Leave this cooking business. But I believe that wise. I'm sure Danjima does that because Mina was waving at me like with a understanding. <laughs> but I mean, normally, a wife should step in and help. A husband can step in and help. But not the one that, uh, and a wife, of, of course, if you work, yeah, the responsibility of finances is the husband's own. But you should. Are you, are you a good? Why wouldn't you sometimes help your husband financially? It's not for the good of the family. But the man will come. I love my wife. Darling, here is breakfast. What would you like for lunch? Darling, here is lunch. What would you like for dinner? Ah, brother, do you cook for your wife every day? Yes, I love her. No, you don't. You are a foolish man. Because the day you don't do it, the wife will come back. Oh, such a tough day today. Honey, is dinner ready? <laughs> You 
lost it with your love. Then you say, eh, no, I was watching soccer. Soccer? Please put that off. I'm hungry. Sorry, darling, I love you. You're a foolish man. Your mother should come and kill you. Or you say, I love my husband. They say we can help. And some of you women do that thing. Some of you women do it. And your marriage is not any better because you do it. Your salary comes 120,000 naira. My king. <laughs> Here is my 120,000. Complete. Good wife. Then the next day, please, I need money for a pad. I need to change my. Did I not buy a pad for you last week? You see your money, you are working. Kukuma just resign and stay at home. My king. You think that will stop him from doing what he's doing outside? Hello? Hi. Marriages are getting healed. It's the truth that sets you free. What does that mean, my king? And you bring your salary. Who is your king? And some of you will not bring your tithe. You will not give. I gave it all to my king. That king will help you in time of adversity. Because he will cause the adversity for you. Those are all warped, warped definitions of love that make it difficult for you to see true love, unconditional love from a God who is love. When you get a revelation of the goodness of God and the love of God, you will know how to relate horizontally. Vertically is God. That has to happen and it spreads out this way. You can't keep it this way and hope that you can push it up against gravity to go that way. No. The man has to love God before he can love you. He can't love you and you try and make him love God. It will never go in that direction. Amen. Let's look at some scriptures about God being love. Deuteronomy 7, 7 to 8. This is a good word. The Lord did not set his love on you, listen, nor choose you because you are more in number than any other people. For you are the least of all peoples, but because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Amen. So not because there was anything awesome about you. God didn't choose to love you because you are the most beautiful. There are people finer than you because you're the smartest. God didn't call you because you're the most handsome to put your charisma on stage. He just chose to. His love chose you. You did nothing to deserve it. That's the love of God. Write down these other scriptures. I may not read all of them. Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 8, 37 to 39. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels... No principalities, no powers, no things present, no things to come, no height, no depth, depth, no any created thing, including Satan. Any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. First John 4, 7 to 11. You can read that at home. Love is of God. Everyone who loves, that is truly loves, is born of God and knows God. 1 John 4, 16, God is love and he who abides in love abides in God 
and God in him. Do you know you can, just like I said earlier, you can hear about the love of God in Christian lingua. Haven't you heard things like, oh, God is love. God so loved us. John 3.16 that he gave. The fact that you say those things in Christian lingua doesn't mean they are revelation to you. I gave the example in the first service of communication between couples. And level two communication is gist. A lot of couples are successful at level two. And they think they're having a good relationship. 15 years later, they finally step into a situation that is sticky. Many times it could be an in-law situation, a financial situation, and they are forced to cross to level three. Where you begin to talk about your own opinions and your spouse counters back with their opinion on your opinion. That's where fire begins to burn. But you spent 15 years as a married couple, gisting. Why? That level is about somebody else. You can be deceived into thinking you know that God is good or God is love. Because you hear it among Christians, you repeat it, but you never step into the deep end. You stay safe. That should not be a portion in Jesus' name. Finally, people still struggle with the truth that God is all powerful. God is all powerful. Is God powerful? Is God powerful? Can he do powerful things? Can he raise the dead? Can he heal the sick? Can he make a poor person wealthy? Can he make a servant governor? Will he heal your body? Can he? Will he? Can he? Will he? Can he? Will he? Some of you answering, will he? Yes. I'm not telling the truth. That is not a revelation to you. Why do I say so? If it was, you will not be looking for alternatives. You will know. Can he provide a husband for you? Will he? Okay, let's put it. Can he provide a husband for a single lady? Regardless of her age. Do you know people he has done that for? But will he do it for you? Then why are you ready to go and get married to an unbeliever? Why are you contemplating going to have a baby? outside of wedlock because your menopause is coming. Can he? Will he? Can he is just something you've heard. Will he is revelation. Do you have that revelation that God is all powerful? If God needs to create a man for you, he can do it. If God needs to relocate a man to where you are, he will do it. Can he? Will he? There's a couple in church that told their testimony of how they got married. It was almost like something out of a Disney movie. He saw the girl. Before he could find, find her name, the girl had left, went for NYSC. Then he saw the girl again. Before he could talk to her, she had left, gone back to Lagos by herself. After two years or so, she came back to Port Harcourt. This young man was still waiting. He didn't know, I don't even sure he knew her name. He just spotted her in church and said, it'll be her and her. By herself, she went to embassy, came back. By herself, she got a job in Lagos and came back. As she, he came back and he saw her, he said, this one, you will not slip out of my hands again. They are married now with a child. God is so powerful, he can do anything. But will he do it for you? If he will, then you don't need alternatives. Glory be to God. That's how powerful God is. But that must be a revelation to you. If all Christians had this revelation, Prayer houses will be out of business. Prophet churches will be out of business. 
Because you know, no matter how long it takes, you know God can and God will. Amen. Let's take some scriptures because my time is up. First Chronicles 29, 11 to 12. Verse 12 says, in your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great. Job 26, 12 to 14. He stares up the sea with his power and by his understanding he breaks up the storm. At the end of 14, the thunder of his power, who can understand? Amen. Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, that is a Pashadah's brother. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your house stretched harm. There is nothing to add for you. Ah, <laughs> at least he was saying ah, but he had a revelation. Glory be to God. I feel like they'd be laughing. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with what? Power. Who went about doing good? Hebrews 4, 12. Talk about God, you talk about his word. The word of God is living and what? Powerful. And Jude 25, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and both now and forever. Amen. Lift your hands, please. God is good. God is love. And God is powerful. There's nothing too hard for him. I have that revelation. Do you have that revelation? Will you seek after that revelation under open heavens? God is good. God is love. And God is powerful. Lift your hands and just worship Him. Worship Him, please. Pray that your eyes will be open. To see these visions, your eyes will be open to hear only his voice and receive revelations. Lift up your hands and declare that to yourself. <laughs>